We're asking when aging actually happens. We have reason to believe that the events that lead to aging can occur many, many years earlier, probably decades. And perhaps in certain cases, the pace of aging is actually set in our 20s or 30s. And that's one of the things we're trying to prove as well. From the USC Leonard Davis School of Gerontology, this is Lessons in Lifespan Health, a podcast about the science and scientists improving how we live and age. I'm Professor George Shannon, Kevin Shu Chair in Gerontology. On today's episode, how Professor Mark Vermulst is using state-of-the-art techniques to identify potential targets for COVID-19 vaccines and treatments, as well as for other diseases of aging. Mark Vermulst is an assistant professor of gerontology at the USC Leonard Davis School who focuses on the role of genetic mutations in human aging and disease. He recently spoke to us about how his research into transcription errors, essentially copying mistakes, aims to strengthen vaccines and delay or prevent diseases. Hi there, George. Hi. Uh, Mark, tell us about your lab. What do you work on uh, when you're not looking at COVID-19? Oh, I see. Yeah, well, my lab is currently growing. There are about eight people in it now. And we do two different things. All of the experiments we do are aimed at understanding the basic biology that underlies aging. But we do it from two different perspectives. One is from mitochondrial mutagenesis, and the other one is called transcription errors. So we work on a mitochondrial component that has to do with energy and energy production. And the other thing, the transcription work is trying to understand how mistakes that occur during biological processes affect the aging process. So those are sort of the two different aims that we currently have. That was the first thing I was going to ask you is you've described transcription errors and what role they play in the disease is something that, that I'm curious about. Well, it's kind of a new topic. There hasn't been too much work done on it. And, and that's what's one of the things that really drew me to it. I've spent a long time working on mitochondrial function in aging. And that has been studied for 40, 50 years now. So I felt I was just only adding things to it. And I wanted to do something new, something different, something nobody had done before. And I started wondering about why I was studying mutations and I thought, well, you know, mutations matter because if your DNA is not correct, you're going to make the wrong protein and that protein can do something bad. For example, cause cancer, Parkinson's disease, all kinds of different things. There is an intermediate step though. When you go from DNA to a protein, there's a short intermediate molecule that needs to be created and that is an RNA molecule. And so conceivably, you can make the wrong protein as well if a mistake occurs in the process of making that RNA molecule. And that process is called transcription. So we study how frequently mistakes occur when RNA molecules are generated and what type of impact that has on aging and disease. So how prevalent are transcription errors? And what, what kind of specific effects can they have? Well, that's been really astonishing. When I first started this project, the reason why it hadn't been studied much was because there was no technique capable of actually finding them. So it was something that we just could not see. And so what my lab did is was we designed a novel tool, a molecular biology tool that allowed us to find these transcript errors across the entire genome. So it was this massive improvement. And suddenly we could observe things that were previously unobservable. And what we discovered with it was that these errors are really, really frequent. And when they happen, there are a couple of impacts that they have. The most important one probably is that they result in incorrect proteins. And those proteins tend to fold in the wrong way. So proteins are large 3D molecules. In order to function, they, this, this long molecule needs to fold in a particular structure. And when you make a mistake in the generation of that protein, 
because of a transcript error, it, the protein tends to misfold. And as it turns out, misfolded proteins are a key component of numerous age-related diseases, including Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. All of these diseases are caused by misfolded proteins. So what we really found, but what I think that we really found, is a new component of the etiology, the origin of all of these diseases. So how much more common are mutations from transcription errors compared to the more ordinary genetic mutations that are uh, inherited? Yeah, so that's a really good question as well. This is one of the key findings of my work, I think, and that is that transcription errors occur a hundred to a thousand fold more frequently than genetic changes. So most of the mistakes that occur in proteins are not due to genetic changes. They are due to these transcript errors. Another thing to think about is that the cells that really matter here, neurons, those are non-dividing cells, cells that cannot replicate themselves. And as a result, they tend to have very few genetic changes because the genetic changes tend to occur when the cell divides. So as a result, genetic changes are probably not that key to neuronal aging, but transcription errors occur continuously. Every neuron is extremely active. They make many, many transcripts every day. And within those transcripts are these errors that can lead to all these unintended consequences. You've described transcription errors using a cooking analogy. Can you share that with us, please? Yeah, sure. I sometimes view proteins as a yummy dish. I think of cells making recipes. So our genome is kind of like a cookbook. In that cookbook are many, many recipes. And each recipe corresponds to the exact way a particular protein needs to be made. And these recipes need to be generated by cooks. And the cooks are sitting in the cytoplasm of the cell. And in order to make the proteins that they want to make, the dish that they want to make, they need to get the recipe. So in essence, then, they need to run to the nucleus, examine this recipe book, look really precisely at our genome, jot down on a piece of paper what the recipe actually is, that is the transcript, if you will, and they bring that then back to the kitchen and bring all of the ingredients for the protein together in the exact right way. That's one way to look at the way cells make proteins. And you can easily imagine that if these cooks are not paying attention when they're jotting down the exact recipes as they're written down in the genome, they can accidentally write down, we need two tablespoons of sugar instead of three, or they can put basil in as opposed to garlic or something like that. And that will make the dish uneatable. And that would probably be what I think of as a mutated or a misfolded protein. You know, A lot of stuff has been put into this dish, but it doesn't gel well together. And that's because one of the cooks accidentally jotted down the wrong recipe. And that's pretty common because they need to do that really, really quick. You know, It's not even a matter of seconds, it's a matter of milliseconds in which they're doing that. And in the meantime, you know, this genome with the recipes in it, it's such a desired book. There's only one copy of them. So there are always 20, 40, hundreds, thousands of cooks at the same time trying to go through this recipe book to find the exact recipe they want to have. They're bumping into each other on their way out of the kitchen. They, they, they bump into many, many other molecules. There are so many ways in which they can make errors. That is sort of how I view the cell and the nucleus where the genome is housed as an extremely busy kitchen where these panicked cooks are running around like chickens without their head, that's trying to jot down all these complex recipes and then race back. <laughs> so so wait, wait a minute, what you're saying is that this, this thing that we call aging happens because too many cooks spoil the aging process. Too many cooks, man, yeah. Exactly. So how do you how do you measure this? How do you find that there are these errors 
that are being made? Well, it's kind of funny. We borrowed a tool from the virology field. There are viruses out there, and those viruses are made out of RNA molecules. And these virologists found a very neat trick in order to determine the sequence of these viral genomes. And we borrowed that trick. It's a technique called circle sequencing. It's a small change to a big data tool called massively parallel sequencing. And because the RNA from these viruses is pretty much the exact same thing as RNA in our cells, we were able to move that tool from the virology field to our own field. We made a couple of changes and we improved it further, but that's pretty much it. So you've kind of explained circle sequencing. You began to talk about this a little bit earlier, how, but how is your work informing what we know about aging processes? Well, there's a couple of things. So one of the things I'm really interested in is the occurrence of age-related diseases, for example, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. And one of the major questions is, why do people get these diseases? There are families that have a mutation that makes them more predisposed to getting these diseases, but that really only explains 5 to maybe 15% of all of the cases. The remaining 85 to 95%, we really have no clue why these people get these diseases. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to explain these remaining 85%. Because all of these diseases are caused by misfolded proteins and transcription errors cause these misfolded proteins, I think that we have found a new mechanism that can cause these diseases. And if the mechanism is indeed correct, that means we can now do something about it. So it's really about finding the origin of the disease itself in order to be able to design medicine for it. That's one of the major goals. We're also asking when aging actually happens. We have reason to believe that the events that lead to aging can occur many, many years earlier, probably decades. And perhaps in certain cases, the pace of aging is actually set in our 20s or 30s. And that's one of the things we're trying to prove as well. That's really interesting because I find myself noticing that I'm 81 years old, so I've been in great health all of my life, but I find that in the last decade, I see myself on a progressive <laughs> downward path in terms of my, certainly my physical acumen. And indeed, it occurs to me that a lot of the things that are bothering me are things that I uh, did to myself when I was in my late teens and early 20s. So I guess that that kind of reinforces what you just said about understanding the uh, progression of aging. Earlier, when I, when I introduced you, I talked about the pandemic and how you're, you're working to uh, understand the effects of the pandemic on not only uh, contemporary life, but uh, the projections to the future. You applied for and received funding to research COVID-19, is that true? Yeah, correct. We were really lucky to get a $200,000 research award from the National Science Foundation. Well, how did that come about? What made you feel that you, uh, you could really provide some insights into the aging experience by researching the COVID-19 epidemic? Well, there's a couple of things. First of all, I think viruses are very interesting. I don't think there's really such a thing as a single form of a virus. Most viruses are what's called a quasi-species. They mutate so fast that there is in one population or one big group of viral particles, there is an enormous genetic variation. Because of that, they're usually referred to as a quasi-species as opposed to an actual species. And these mutations, this genetic variation really matters because one of the reasons why viruses become resistant to vaccines or to drugs is because there is always one viral particle that happens to get a mutation that allows it to be resistant. So one of the major things people want to know about viral particles and different kinds of viruses is how fast do mutations accumulate in the genome of these viruses. And they want to do that for two different reasons. First of all, they want to know that because they want to be able to predict how quickly viruses might get 
resistance to certain treatments or vaccines, the higher the mutation rate, the faster that would happen. Secondly, they want to be able to predict what type of viruses might erupt in the future. So we now know that, for example, that coronavirus has a certain genetic composition, but that composition might be completely different next year or the year afterwards. So by doing these mutational analyses, we're able to predict, hopefully, what the virus might look like in the future. So we can better prepare for an outbreak in 2022 or 2023. It's been a really rewarding project. So the reason why I got into it is A, because of my interest in genetic mutations, and that's a key component of the viral particles. And secondly, because the coronavirus is an RNA virus. We had this tool that we initially stole from the virology field. We changed it. We made it a little bit better. And we were using that to study our own cells. But now that this coronavirus came up, we're wondering, well, wait a minute. Can't we use our improved tool and use it for what it was initially intended for, which is to study the rate of mutation in viral particles? So that's what we've been doing. So we've used this super powerful big data tool to study how the virus mutates inside cells. And we have a couple of different goals with it. First of all, we want to determine how quickly these mutations actually happen right? So that will give us an answer as to how quickly viral particles might come up with mutations that make it resistant to certain treatments and vaccines. And we've already heard on the news that new mutant versions of the virus have come up, right? There's a strain from Brazil, there's a strain from England that are more virulent and more dangerous than the initial coronavirus. So that is one of the consequences of the genetic changes. What you're saying is really important because I just got my second uh, vaccine a couple of weeks ago. So I've, I've actually passed that first criteria to resistance. But uh, when you're talking about these different variations on the virus, can you take the research that you're doing and uh, manifest it in terms of uh, treatments? Yes, I think so. And the reason is that our tool, the tool that we're using, is so powerful. And this is what we're trying to do. This is sort of the second goal of our project. There are mutations that would lead to the death of the virus that is conceivable, right? The virus has uh, key proteins that it needs to make in order to uh, produce the envelope of the virus itself, all kinds of surface proteins. And these proteins are essential. So certain genetic changes will destroy those proteins and that will result in the death of the virus. So if we do a massive analysis of the entire genome of this virus, and we do that over time, what we will find is that there are mutations present everywhere on the viral genome, except for those few spots where the mutation kills the actual virus, right? There's no mutation to be found from a dead virus. So by virtue of looking at locations in the genome or finding them where mutations do not occur, we can find these Achilles heels of the virus. And that would allow us to guide the development of vaccines to that specific spot. Uh, I told you earlier that viruses are sometimes referred to as a quasi-species. They mutate very, very fast. And as a result, they become resistant to different types of treatments. However, if we target the vaccine to a spot that cannot be mutated, that means that the virus has two choices. It can either be destroyed by the vaccine or the treatment itself. And in an effort to try to get out of it, it could mutate that position of its genome, but in doing so, it will kill itself. So it's a uh, no-win situation for the virus. That is one of the goals of this project also. Oh, that's really wonderful. I, I think it's just so exciting to hear that you're doing work that can really... Uh resonate and, and have a uh, strong influence on terminating this pandemic as quickly as possible so we can all get back to our lives. What are your future goals? What, uh, what are you going to do next? 
Well, there are a couple of different things we're trying to do. We're certainly pushing this project of the COVID virus. This is an international collaboration of my lab uh, with a lab in Mississippi and a lab in Holland. We're trying to address this almost philosophical question of when aging happens, right? That will be a really important component of my lab in the coming two years. And then we have some other projects on the horizon. The most exciting, to me anyways, is a new project. And we were trying to understand how the organelles, the little tiny miniature organs of our cells, how these organelles function. We have this beautiful strategy using different fluorescent proteins, uh, green proteins, red proteins, and blue ones that light up these different organelles like a Christmas tree. We're trying to use this fluorescent strategy to understand how they're capable of doing what they're doing. It's almost a mixture between painting and science. And we're hoping to find new causes of human aging with it and potentially new disease genes. And I, I think this would be unusually fruitful uh, if it works. It's a completely new form of looking at the biology of cells. It's just wonderful to hear you say they uh, discuss the idea of merging art and science in this way that can be so productive in terms of uh, our future well-being. It's really exciting work. Thank you very much. Is there anything else that, uh, that we haven't touched on that you think would be important to share with our listeners? No, I think we talked about most of it. Thank you. Okay, that's great. Thank you so much. Really appreciate the work that you're doing and uh, the way you express it. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, that wraps up this lesson in lifespan health. Thanks to Professor Mark Vermultz for his time and expertise and to all of you for choosing to listen. Join us next time for another Lesson in Lifespan Health. And please subscribe to our podcast at lifespanhealth.usc.edu. Lessons in Lifespan Health is supported by the NAE Center for Healthspan Science and Center for Lifespan Health.